Hello, everyone. In this video, we're going to cover Chapter 3, uh, The Properties of Water and How It Affects Biological Life. Uh, this will be a shorter video. I won't spend as much time um, uh, going over simple details. I'm really going to focus on the properties of water and why water is so important. Um, so this here is a ring seal. The ring seal spends most of its life on the ice. It does a lot of its um, normal day-to-day -day activities on the ice. It hunts on the ice, it sleeps on the ice, and it reproduces on the ice. And so why, why is that important? It's important because our ice is disappearing. And so, but the properties of water, uh, the ability to form ice, is very unique. And so let's go over the different properties. How does water structure allow it to form solid ice? How does, which, why does a solid float on top of a liquid? Well, it has to do with the unique structure of the water molecule, which we're gonna cover uh, later on in this um, PowerPoint. So water molecules are polar molecules and they have special attractions called hydrogen bonds um, that gives it its unique um, bonding to each other. Uh, and so because of this attraction, when water freezes and becomes a solid, it forms a crystalline structure that is less dense than the liquid. And so water has a very unique uh, characteristic in that it forms uh, solids that are less dense than its liquids, which allows its solid ice to flow. So once again, water is a polar uh, molecule, uh, meaning that its overall charge is unevenly distributed um, because it has polar covalent bonds between the oxygen and hydrogen atoms. This polarity uh, meaning that one side of the molecule is um, slightly negative and one side is slightly positive, allows for water molecules to form hydrogen bonds with other water molecules. And so this diagram is showing you how the polar covalent bonds, the hydrogens are slightly positive, the oxygen atom is slightly negative, and so they then will form an attraction with other water molecules for example, the oxygen in this one will be attracted to the hydrogen in this one, and that will form a, a quote-unquote uh, bond. It's an, it's an attraction bond, but it's a bond nonetheless. And so water molecules have this unique characteristic. <clears throat> because of the unique properties of the water molecule and its polar nature, there are four emergent properties that exist with water and um, allow for the unique nature of biological life to uh, evolve on the planet. So let's go over the four different um, water properties that facilitate an environment for life on the earth. The first thing that we're gonna cover here is cohesion of water molecules cohesion in that collectively all of the hydrogen bonds that water molecules have together is called a cohesion. Uh, and that cohesive force results in a high surface tension, um, meaning that it, it's a little difficult for uh, objects or even for the hydrogen bonds of the water molecules to stretch to a point where they will actually break um, the surface of uh, the, the, the liquid. And so, for example, we all know of um, water striders. It's a water strider, spider. There's many different um, water-based spiders that can um, scurry across the surface of water. And so what's happening here is their legs um, are spread out in a way where there's an equal pressure on the surface of the water molecules where it's 
not strong enough to actually break the surface because the water molecules have enough uh, cohesiveness that the spider doesn't break the actual surface. So cohesion is very important because basically it causes water molecules to have a stickiness. They will stick together, um, which actually is a good thing when you're talking about uh, water and its ability to pull on the planet. Cohesion also contributes to the transport of water and dissolved nutrients against gravity in plants. Um, another aspect of the cohesive nature of water molecules is that it also has adhesion, which means that it has an attraction between the water molecules and different surfaces. Um, so those hydrogen bonds, so they like to be sticky. Water molecules are sticky. Um, and this is seen between water and plants and the internal structure of a plant, such as the cell walls. And it helps, for example, in um, the natural flow of allowing water to travel through plants, which is needed for all of the cellular functions that plants need. So I just wanted to throw this image in here about how water molecules are adhesive, meaning that they stick to other surfaces, such as these water molecules are sticking to the leaves of this plant. Thank, uh, thankfully for this characteristic, um, water molecules can be absorbed as well. So just think about the next time you're getting out of the shower and you're going to dry yourself off with a towel um, because of the adhesive nature of water molecules, uh, they actually are able to be absorbed into um, the threads of a towel. And so, um, which is really, really great. Could you imagine if you couldn't, <laughs> if water wasn't adhesive, that would be kind of mind blowing. But anyway, um, but going back to biological function, um, it's the adhesive and cohesive nature of the water molecules that allow for them to be able to actually travel through the cells of a plant, um, the um, water conducting cells of a plant that allows for them to um, carry water and use it throughout the plant body, even to the point where evaporation will happen and water will be um, released back into the atmosphere. And that, that, was, that was the first characteristic of um, water molecules. The second property or characteristic that we're gonna look at is that water uh, allows for moderation of temperature. So water absorbs heat from warmer air and it releases that stored heat into cooler air. Water can also absorb and release a large amount of heat with only a slight change in its own temperature. And so because of that nature, um, water has a high um, heat capacity. So let's talk about heat and energy for a second. So kinetic energy is the energy in motion um, compared to that to say for like potential energy, which is energy that is stored in the potential of an object, for example. Or kinetic energy is the energy that's in motion that you're using at that time. Kinetic energy with um, atoms or molecules and the random motion that they have is called thermal energy. Um, so you can kind of think of it as that all of the atoms and molecules that form, say for example, your human body is creating thermal energy. Temperature represents that average kinetic energy um, for a body, for example. Humans have an average temperature of around 98.6 degrees. And that can fluctuate a few degrees depending on the person 
but for the most part, that is our body temperature. That thermal energy um, can be transferred from one body of matter to another, and that transfer of energy is what we call heat. Um, so our thermal energy, our temperature is 98.6 degrees, and so whenever we're creating too much energy, which our bodies do that all the time, um, we release energy as in the form of heat. Same thing as like when you're um, with, with any heat transfer, um, like for example, if you're trying to warm up water on a stove, um, the heat is transferred from the stove to the object through radiation and then uh, heat for water in particularly is through convection. And so a calorie, and I want to emphasize this is what we, I, we call in the plant sciences as a lowercase calorie, is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. It's also the amount of heat released when one gram of water cools by one degree Celsius. Um, and so one gram of water, you guys may not realize this, but it's a small amount. It's, um, you could visualize it as like maybe like a drop of water. So that when you're actually looking at the food packages, the food labels that we're used to about calories, those are the capital calorie, um, which really represents a kilocalorie and that it's a thousand calories. So for example, if there's a food product, um, say like a Coca-Cola and it has 160 calories, what it's really telling you is that there's 160,000 uh, calories in that object, uh, food product. Why is this important? Well, because we measure heat and, and the energy needed to change um, the temperature of water um, by calories. And calories is just a form of an energy measurement where joules is a unit of energy. And so joules and calories can be converted um, interchangeably. Water um, has a high specific heat, uh, meaning that uh, it's the amount of heat that is needed to change or the temperature of one gram by uh, one degree Celsius. Uh, the specific heat of water is one calorie per gram uh, of one degree Celsius. Now, you, you have no uh, comparison here, but I would just let you guys know that that's a very high amount of energy that is needed. That's a high specific heat. So water has one of the high specific heats um, that I know of. So water resists changing its temperature because of its high specific heat, meaning that water molecules are able to absorb a lot of heat before it actually changes the chemical structure of the molecule. And because of that, life is able to flourish on the planet. Um, water's high specific heat can be traced to the hydrogen bonds. So because water forms hydrogen bonds with from molecule to molecule, um, energy can be stored in those bonds. So heat is absorbed when hydrogen bonds break and heat is released when hydrogen bonds form. And so the high specific heat of the water molecules minimizes temperature fluctuations on the planet. It also means that the oceans, for example, large bodies of water are able to absorb and store a large amount of heat, um, which is why the, for example, the oceans will stay warm at night while land will get cold uh, during the night, will cool down. Uh, it's also one of the reasons why, uh, because of our Gulf streams and 
currents on the planet, some areas of the planet, the land is warmer because the water is warmer, uh, that heat is being transferred from the ocean to the land. Um, and so you can see this here in um, this uh, diagram here that because the ocean and bodies of water can absorb a lot of heat, it takes a lot of heat to change the temperature of the water. Um, coasts are usually cooler than inland. So this is just showing you the coast of California, for example, Los Angeles to San Diego. The temperatures there along the coast are in the 70s, where if you move inward towards, your, for example, San Bernardino, uh, you jump to 100 degrees. It's also important to realize that the ocean heat, um, the oceans are getting warmer um, over time. We are noticing that the ocean is absorbing and getting warmer. It's absorbing a large amount of heat. Um, this is based upon several different factors. For, for example, increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, meaning that um, there's more um, greenhouse gases, there's more uh, heat absorption because of that. But the ice, the polar ice caps are melting, meaning there's less, there's less ice to prevent um, sunlight um, from being um, hitting the ocean. So more ocean water is absorbing heat. Um, so there are several different reasons why um, the oceans are getting warmer, and this is not a good thing. It's not a good thing at all. Um, you, you may not realize it, but the oceans getting warmer will, will have a detrimental effect upon some species to the point where we may reach a, a point in time where we have no polar ice, and several species will go extinct because of that. Um, the third property of water that we want to talk about is that it allows for evaporative cooling. So evaporation is the transformation of um, a liquid to a gas. The heat evaporation is the amount of heat that's required to convert a gram of a liquid into a gas. So as a liquid evaporates, one of the things that it does is it takes the heat from the surface with it. So the remaining surface will cool through a process called evaporative cooling. Evaporative cooling of water helps stabilize temperatures for many organisms on the planet. And this image here you can see you know the elephant will spray its body with water and so as the water molecules are absorbing heat and get converted from uh, a liquid to a gas the surface will get cooler so the elephant will cool down his body will cool down um the elephant and like many other mammals on the planet also will sweat so when you get hot you sweat and so what is happening is your body's trying to cool your itself down by sweating. As the as you sweat, the water will evaporate and you'll get colder. You'll cool down. The next property we're going to talk about is that water molecules, um, as they become solids, turn into ice and ice floats. Um, instead of sinks because it's less dense. So water is less dense as a solid than as a liquid, which is amazing if you think about it. So unique, very special. And because of this unique property of water, a lot of life has adapted uh, to these ice conditions, ice habitats, uh, that exists around the planet. Um, so at zero degrees Celsius, water molecules are locked in a crystalline lattice, which means they form more of a crystalline structure um, compared to uh, 
a more clumpy structure when they are a liquid. So it is this crystalline hydrogen bond structure that allows for ice to float. When water is around four degrees Celsius, it's actually at its greatest density um, compared to uh, when it's uh, at a solid, which is at ice. If ice was more dense than the liquid, then ice would sink. Ice would sink to the bottom of the lakes and the oceans of our planet. And then that means that no life could exist in the depths of our water bodies. Ice floats, and so it insulates a lot of the environments that are below it, and it keeps them safe. And so you guys could read more about it, but there are many amazing uh, environments and habitats that exist on the planet because ice is able to float. Um, but many scientists are very worried about global warming and the idea of losing our ice habitats uh, at the rate that we're going um, we will probably be the first generation to live to see um, that there could be no polar ice uh, during the summers on the planet so for example in this diagram you have uh, the pink line here representing the medium extent of ice from September of 1981 to 2010. And what you've noticed here is that the ice uh, was, it, it covered a lot more ocean than it did, for example, in 2019, which is represented by the blue line. We're summer after summer, we're, what we're noticing is that there's less ice coverage, um, especially in the Northern Arctic. Um, I can remember that there were times where the ice would cover the Bering Strait and you could actually walk from Alaska to Russia. Um, but I don't think that's happened for a very long time. For example, during World War II, um, ships were not able to travel. Ships were not able to travel uh, through uh, the Arctic, but now there's actually uh, sea routes and shipping lanes that go through the Arctic. Now, some species will benefit from the loss of ice, species that are not dependent upon ice. The capelin, the bowhead whales, phytoplankton species, they're not going to be harmed by the loss of ice. So some species will benefit, but some species will be harmed by the loss of ice. For example, polar bears, uh, the, the black guillemots, the Pacific walrus, these species will all um, uh, decline or may even become extinct due to the loss of their natural habitats, the habitats that they have um, evolved and uh, adapted to. Um, the last property of water that I want to go over is that water is the universal solvent. Water is the solvent of life. Um, a solution is a liquid that is completely homogeneous. Um, it's a mixture of substances. Uh, so a solution is a mixture of different things. We all make <laughs> solutions all the time. If you're going home and you're making Kool-Aid, you're making a solution. Um, you can call yourself a, a witch of the kitchen and if you want to do that. Um, so anything you make, for example, mix things together in a liquid is a solution. <clears throat> a solvent is the dissolving agent. It's the agent that is used to dissolve uh, solutes. So solutes is the substance that is dissolved in the solvent. Um, for in the Kool-Aid example, water is the solvent and the solute would be your sugars, for example. 
Um, if it involves a liquid that is water, it's called an aqueous solution. It's in which water is used to be the solvent. And so in this diagram, you're seeing a beaker of water and some salt, table salt, sodium chloride. And so this is just showing you why water is the universal solvent. Water molecules will be attracted to the ions that form um, our solvents. So the negatively, partly negative oxygens are going to be slightly attracted to the positive uh, sodium ions here. And the slightly negative hydrogens are going to be uh, attracted to the uh, slightly positive um, hydrogens are going to be slightly attracted to the negative chlorine. And so I, I always imagine and call the water molecules the Mickey Mouses of their water of uh, molecules. But what they would do is they literally would go in and just wiggle their ways in and, and slightly pull apart the ions and separate them until they're evenly distributed within the water solution. So water is a very versatile solution due to its polarity um, because of the polar nature of the water molecule. And when a ion is surrounded by a water, water molecules, we call that its hydration shell. Water can also dissolve compounds that are non-ionic polar molecules. Um, a lot of large... Um, molecules exist that are uh, not necessarily ionic in nature, or they can be very large ionic molecules, um, polar molecules, they can also be dissolved in water because they have a charged regions um, as well. So water molecules are not only um, do they have partial charges based on uh, the polarity of the molecule, but they're also able to form uh, hydrogen bonds with other um, molecules, which is what this is showing you here. So even though a substance may not be um, polar in nature, it still can form um, these unique bonds that allows it to break apart and separate um, and f fully dissolve things in water. Now, while water molecules are able to dissolve most things, there are some things that exist that water molecules just have a really hard time dealing with. And so we really need to talk about hydrophilic and hydrophobic structure uh, substances and the structure of certain um, molecules. Hydrophilic is a substance that has an affinity to water. So hydro meaning water, philic means loving. So there are molecules and substances that exist that are water loving. They love the water. There are some substances that exist that are hydrophobic, meaning that they are water fearing substances and that they do not have an affinity to water at all. The best example of something that is hydrophobic is oil molecules. Um, they are hydrophobic because they have a lot of nonpolar bonds. They, they're not polar like water molecules. They're nonpolar. Hydrophobic molecules um, such as oils um, form the major ingredients of our cell membranes. And that's important because, for example, if you're touching your skin, touch your skin, that's a lot of um, oil-based hydrophobic molecules, um, which is good. Our bodies do absorb some water, for example, through our skin, um, but it also keeps a lot of stuff inside the body. And so a slight, <clears throat> you know, shift in focus, but we, we want to talk about 
how water molecules are extremely important. The characteristics and properties of water um, are extremely important in the evolution of life on the planet. Um, and so the water molecule is so important to life that scientists search for um, water on other planets and other systems or even in planets or moons in our own solar system uh, to be an indicator for life. So we're constantly seeking out and trying to find other celestial bodies that have water. Of the 800 planets, um, over 800 planets have been found outside of our solar system. There's evidence of water vapor in their atmospheres. And even on our, our, in our own solar system, Mars has been, it's discovered that water it still exists. And um, at one point, maybe the planet was covered with water. And so these dark streaks here, this is an image of Mars. The dark streaks represent um, water flow uh, on the plant on the surface of the planet. We even have evidence to show that um, uh, uh, the moon may actually have water. And so if you've been keeping up with the news lately, um, the India's um, space program just landed a successfully landed a rover on the south pole of the moon which is um hypothesized to have a lot of water uh in the in in the soil there so very fascinating 